It's clear that we are in an era of change. We're witnessing a dramatic rise in populist movements around the globe and across the political spectrum. We have challenges and opportunities from a changing climate, growing inequity, and a rapidly advancing technology. As a society, we are just beginning to confront privilege, our colonial histories, and the state of our natural env environment. Civic discourse is more important than ever, but our civic society is becoming increasingly fragmented and polarized. La prochaine table ronde examine le rôle de la santé communautaire dans ce nouveau climat politique. How can we step forward as leaders to foster civic engagements and dialogue about public policy? How can we contribute to building a more inclusive, more equ equitable, and healthier society? Our panelists this afternoon are community health leaders from across Canada and the United States. They're here to share specific examples of what they are witnessing on the ground and how they are advancing community well-being and health equity in the context of this brave new world. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Stephanie Harrison, who is the CEO of the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association, her state's association for community health centers. She was also a founding member of Wisconsin Partners, a community building network focused on building enduring broad-based relationships that make bold action possible, as well as Jemanjia, President and CEO of the St. John's Well Child and Family Center in South Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Jim. St. John's is a fairly funded community health center and provides healthcare services, including direct access to health for undocumented immigrants and homeless persons. They also address the social determinants of health, advocating for just social policies and fighting poverty. Angela Robertson, familiar to us, is the executive director of the Partel Queen West Community Health Center in Toronto. Angela has worked. I heard a shout out for Angela. I'm not going to watch that. <laughs> Angela's work is the Director of Equity and Community Development at Women's College Hospital and is the Executive Director of Sistering, a Women's Place. Nadine Sukermani is the ED of the Women's Health Clinic in Winnipeg. Welcome, Nadine. She has been an advocate and social justice educator for over 25 years. She also has a decade of working experience in the nonprofit sector, working to end gender-based violence across Ontario. She is passionate about her anti-oppressive, harm reduction, community-based health and reproductive justice issues. And our moderator today, familiar to us, is Kate Mulligan, who serves as the Director of Policy and Communications at the Alliance for Healthy Communities. Kate is passionate about health equity, advocacy, and public policy. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So as Christopher and Patrick mentioned, I'm the Director of Policy and Communication. So I spend a lot of time on the small P politics, like things like navigating partisan political environments and getting short-term strategic and tactical things done, um, things that get us from point A to point B. But that's not the focus of this panel, although some of those legislative moments might come up in conversation. This is really about those big P politics, the macro forces that are affecting our lives and our work and our communities around the globe and across North America. So in that spirit, I'm going to ask each of our panelists, and please just jump in um, as you see fit, what are the broad political trends that are affecting you or your org organization or your communities where you are? Um, so I'll kind of jump in. Um, so I think one of the things just building on the introduction is the increasing populist right-wing agenda that I think is proliferating both our local politics or national politics and I would say international. And the manifestation of that for me and for my communities is an increase in the intensification of anti-black racism. Um, that in the moment of reconciliation and speaking to the slow genocide for indigenous women um, and communities in Canada is we also see a correlation as well with increasing anti-indigenous racism. 
Um, we also have seen the manifestation of anti-immigrant, anti-Islam, um, and Islamophobia sentiments in our communities. And in some of the earlier panels that we were in earlier on today, is we have seen the increase in hate crimes targeting particular communities. So we have seen increase in anti-Semitism, we have seen in anti-Black um, anti racism, and we have seen increase in transphobia. Um, in our communities that I think is on, kind of building on the bedrock of this new populist agenda. I think the other piece that I think is also curious for me, and I think for many of us in this room, is that the populist agenda is being presented to us as an agenda that is supposed to be speaking for the common folk, the working peoples, and defending those agendas. But the irony and the wicked irony of it for me is that the people who are espousing that are folks who belong to the elite, are folks who belong to dominant cultures, and are folks who belong to wealth, who are kind of using that language to have us as marginalized populations be against each other. And I'll just wrap up by kind of speaking to the fact that the manifestation of that looks like cuts to sex ed, um, cuts to um, education for indigenous populations and cuts to indigenous affairs. Um, it looks like the rescinding of commitments around expanding harm reduction programs across the province. Um, and it looks like cuts to things that sustain working people like minimum wage. So those are, I think, the ways in which I have, I'm seeing the manifestation of that in our communities. Well, I guess um, <clears throat> from a, a United States perspective, um, I guess we can't talk about this without uttering the five-letter word uh, <laughs> of Trump. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, in, the environment that he's created uh, and that his party has created in the United States um, is, is one in which we're seeing a dramatic shift um, from progressive widely termed progressive um, values um, to uh, xenophobia, racism, anti-immigration, anti-LGBT, uh, in practice in many different ways. So it's legislative, it's administrative, uh, as well as um, in public relations. And so we're seeing, as community health centers, um, we're seeing these tweaks in administrative rules, which for example, community health centers are not allowed now to refer patients for abortion, mm -hmm. let alone provide abortion um, in the United States. Um, we're also, the anti-immigration fervor has gotten so bad that um, you know, it's dramatically impacted our patient population. So St. John's, um, it, we're the largest healthcare provider in South LA, which is the largest area of contiguous poverty in the United States. Um, we're home to the largest group of undocumented immigrants uh, in the country. And St. John's is the largest provider of services to the undocumented community in the United States. And we see every day patients coming into 12, 13, 14 year old boys and girls bringing their five and six year old um, siblings in for their annual physicals um, because their parents have been deported and they're literally caring for their younger children. Uh, we're seeing situations where moms and dads are coming in and asking for extra bottles of their diabetes medication because they're afraid they're gonna be deported or copies of their children's medical records because they're afraid they're gonna be deported. Um, just two weeks ago, um, somebody came into our lobby and said, La Migra, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, it means immigration, uh, La Migra está allá, it's on the corner, and 350 people ran out of the waiting room. So we, we had to do so many, and we'll talk about this in the follow-up questions as to what we did in response to this, um, but we saw initially a 10% drop in patient visits um, as a result of, of the election of Donald Trump and all of the vitriol and hatred spewing out of his mouth and out of um, the administration's policies. So we're, we're in a very, very dire situation in the United States and obviously we're, we're all praying for 2020. <laughs> and the 2018 elections actually provided somewhat of a check on, on what he's been doing, but 
that we can't check the administrative tweaks that they're doing in the Department of Health and Human Services or at the executive level, and it's having a profound impact on our communities. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I'm not going to repeat. I mean, Angela, I feel like what you said was exactly what I wrote here, so I'm just going to let that sit. Um, but I, I will say that for me, uh, so I'm, although my bio reads as Ontario, I'm here representing Manitoba and the rest of the country. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're outside looking in, <laughs> it is different. I'll tell, I'll tell you that. Um, but that being said, you know, what really sticks out for me is decolonization. So as we talk about anti-black racism, anti-indigenous issues, when we talk about white supremacy and the creep that we are seeing small p politically but also large p is that it is having an impact in everything that we do. From the day to day, the microaggressions and the unconscious bias that we receive, especially as racialized leaders of organizations that are doing this work. We look around this room and you represent what community health looks like, right? We know this, this is not a secret. Um, and I heard this morning Senator Thomas Bernard, or yeah, this morning in the Black Health Equity session uh, said, you know, she's asked, why do you have to bring race into this? Or why do you always have to bring race into this? The reality of that question is you don't get it because you don't live in that body. And when we talk about not just our clients, but I want to bring in as well leadership and the people that we represent, um, we have to. We have to bring race. We have to bring queer identity. We have to talk about disability, age, refugees, newcomers, people who don't have status. And that brings me to disruption of the systems that are not going to dismantle what's happening. And we hear that from our indigenous folks, the people we work alongside, and those of us who are talking about reconciliation, we need to act. I spent last Monday, the morning of the report of the missing and murdered indigenous women's uh, inquiry, in three hours in circle, in circle, in a sharing circle, with women across the country who were talking about, we were there to talk about housing and homelessness, a gendered lens of housing and homelessness, but we spent three hours talking about violence and racism and the realities of genocide. And that is what we have to insert into this conversation. As the right wing populism creeps across our country, we really need to pay attention to the legal and constitutional implications that this has for us. And I, I, you know, I, I, I charge each one of you to look into that because they can, um, they can actually change the foundations of our charter and what we have here in the country. So I'll start with that. <laughs> uh, so before I answer the question proper, I just want to commend all of you. I have been tr so tremendously impressed by all of you and inspired. Um, it's been really fab fabulous and I feel very honored to be here today with you. Um, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a, a bit of a liberal oasis in a fairly red state. Uh, we call ourselves a purple state um, because in, in the US we pretty much have a binary system. It's liberal Democrat and conservative Republican, um, which I think fuels this sense of polarization in the country. You're either this or you're that. Um, as a sign of how uh, purple we are, uh, our state in 2016 elected Donald Trump. We went to Donald, for Donald Trump in the national election. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, elected a liberal lesbian senator uh, to represent us in Congress. <laughs> and so um, try to make sense of that. Um, <laughs> that's the world I live in. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Just a little bit about Wisconsin. In 2011, our governor, who was a Republican at the time, uh, passed some very divisive legislation uh, around unions. And um, in particular, uh, the teachers were unduly impacted. And what we saw as a result of that, that was that families were unfriending each other, teachers were being publicly shamed, 
um, there was an extreme focus on silos and people were hunkering down and trying to protect their own um, institutions. And this goes all the way back to the Columbine shootings and the book that came after that called Bowling Alone. Institutions have been in decline. The, the institutions that give us our social glue, like churches, have been in decline. Um, and so, and associations like ours have been struggling. Um, individuals are increasingly isolated in the midst of this environment um, because they don't know who they can trust and who is with them. And while you might be with me for one thing, you're against me for another thing, which fuels isolation. And then we wonder why there's an increase in substance abuse. My, one of my members has a tagline on her email that says, addiction is not, uh, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm -hmm. The same thesis came through in uh, Sam Quinones' book, uh, Dreamland, which talked about the opioid crisis in the U.S. And his conclusion was, we, can, we, we need to start healing our communities if we are going to make any dent in trying to resist this populist movement. So we, we, in the midst of that, we've had increasing awareness that we can't do business as usual in this environment. We've had to think about how to partner across our silos. Um, and we've also had opportunities to think about our assets. So our health centers, our boards, our staffs at our community health centers represent that entire political spectrum. We have passionate people about community health that also voted for, for Trump, right? We have passionate people for community health that live in urban inner city Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all of that, there's some, there's some the narrative is in rural areas they think all the resources are going to Milwaukee. And if you actually visited Milwaukee, you, were, you would be very clear that all the resources are not going to Milwaukee. And so um, we've been in this position of trying to really navigate this and now have eight years of practice, given that we've been in this hyper-polarized environment for that long. All right, thank you all. So I'm, uh, you know, it does seem that these political trends are about setting up divisions between us, mm -hmm. uh, between national borders, urban and rural, interprovincial, uh, indigenous and settlers, different levels of government, and on and on. And I want to ask you that given this context that we are finding ourselves in, what strategies are you taking or would you like to see us take that engage us together, that engage communities and our community health organizations in civic life together? Yeah. Maybe I can jump in, yeah. just continuity story. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have been trying to really build cross health center connections. And so like I mentioned, we have a health center in Milwaukee that's predominantly African American led. Um, they're dealing with systematic racism. Um, but many of their challenges, and on my board as an example, we have recognized virtually every issue is similar. It manifests itself differently, but the root cause is very similar. They are trying to do a little bit of um, pairing with a rural health center and actually doing site visits to each other with staff um, as a way to see what the reality is, as a way to build empathy with, with a colleague across the state. We're also doing cross-sector relationship building and we're using a couple of core sets of tools. Um, this is in the bio what was referenced. It's an organization called Wisconsin Partners. We're using a community organizing framework um, around that, although we don't use the word community organizing because it's too liberal sounding. Um, we um, also use the asset-based community development framework, um, the framework that's outlined in the seven habits of highly depolarizing people, and also servant leadership. Um, we're also trying to really build efficacy, both at an individual and a community level. And so what I've, how many of you know what motivational interviewing is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I often say like what motivational interviewing is to an individual, community organizing is and can be for a community. It's about building efficacy, reducing the sense of victimization, and building community at the same time. Um, and lastly, I think the thing that we've recognized is if we are genuinely about healing and being spaces of healing, we have to take it on as our mission to also heal our communities. And the only way we can do that is to sort of buckle in for some hard conversations um, to try and get to what we all care about instead of just the political bumper sticker that separates us. Mm -hmm. And um, from where I sit, um, I think one of the pieces for me around um, the work that we do and why we're all in this room 
is that our work is social change work, um, is that we are um, social change agents. And by virtue of the communities who we um, strive to serve and the values that underpin the work that we do is that we are not divorced from social justice action and this thing called activism that um, in, uh, and I don't mean activism purely in a party politics sense, I'm talking about activism when we connect to issues of social determinants of health. Um, and I keep reminding everywhere I go um, when we talk about, and the question came up earlier around engaging with um, party politics as one of the sites for initiating and activating change. And um, that with each new cycle of political leadership is we try to modify um, our agenda to fit their agenda um, and or to speak their language um, to effect change for our populations. And one of the things that I remind myself constantly of and bring to this table is that Governments will change cycle over cycle, but the people who we serve and the agenda and the interest that they have remain constant. And that they look to us, so as an activist, um, as part of our civic role, is to carry and be a partner with the communities who we serve, to carry those voices and those agendas forward because they don't get washed away with each new wave of political leadership that we get. The other piece for me around civic um, engagement and collaboration is I am looking for a group to start a campaign about what does your taxes pay for? Because oftentimes the language that get used is that the things that we're creating are for taxpayers. And there is somehow underneath that the suggestion that there are people who are not contributing to the tax roll that then will benefit from all of the things that are healthcare, social justice, income equality, um, strategies, etc. And I think that for me at the local level in our communities is doing some work around engaging our communities, our partners, um, our community of um, service users around demystifying what taxes pay for and what their taxes pay for and therefore what they're entitled to ask for. The other piece that I think is important for me as a strategy and I think for us as a strategy is the fact that the levers that create sites of inequality are all interconnected is that the levers that create poverty, the levers that feed homophobia, the levers that feed transphobia, that feed anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, that they're all, in, and colonization, that they're all interconnected. And we too then need to challenge ourselves about interconnecting our own sites of struggle and organizing. And I think building on the presenter um, earlier on, er, um, this morning, is that there needs to be some interconnectedness. Um, and you know, we talk about the language of intersectionality, but I think we need to bring that intersectionality to how we actually do the work on the ground. Because we cannot fight for my uh, liberation and leave li um, inequality in the path of others and feel like that is justice. So I feel like we need to, we, we need to transform and look at how oppression is manifested and use um, that, the, the strategy of their interconnectedness to bring that to our movements. Um, is, my, is my mic on? Okay, here we go. So I, I, I um, am moved and um, completely agree with um, what the panel is, uh, the two panelists before me are saying, and I'm sure I will agree and be moved by what you say as well. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. And, um, you know, as an American, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, but, you know, we always look to the North uh, for what progressive engagement looks like. 
Um, so the fact that you're having the same conversation that we are, maybe a couple years behind it in a way, as far as who your prime minister will be, um, as opposed to who our president is, um, it's it's it, it shows the relationships and how important those relationships are uh, globally. Um, but I think you know this issue of community organizing, and this issue of how to, and this is an overused word, but for lack of a better word, how to empower our communities to fight back and resist has really been at the essence of what we've been doing at St. John's. Now, granted, we live in California. We live in Los Angeles. Um, but it's not like we haven't had fights with our local government around increasing healthcare services for immigrant populations. And this is a completely Democratic Party controlled state. Two thirds of the legislature, the governor, the mayor, every city council member in LA except one, um, the board of supervisors are all Democrats. And yet they tried to cut immigrant health services in the county of Los Angeles. And St. John's had to bring out 800 patients um, to the board of supervisors to shut down the chamber in order to prevent them from making these cuts. And so, you know, I think it's what we've done is really talk about how to organize our employees and our patients to resist and fight back. And I don't mean to sound impolite, um, because I know that um, one of the things I love about Canada is how polite everybody is. <laughs> and it's not like that in the United States. Um, but you have to fight. And so, for example, when the administration announced that they were going to um, raid, increase the raids, the immigration raids throughout the, the country. Um, now, Mark, LA is a big place. South LA has 1.5 million people. It's larger than the city of Philadelphia. It's, it's probably, you know, almost as big as Toronto. And that's just South LA which is a small part of Los Angeles, relatively speaking. Um, but there were raids going on at bus stops and factories. And, and so we trained our employees to form a human chain around the entrances of our 18 clinic sites. Because according to federal law in the United States, um, community health centers are sa safe spaces that um, police authorities cannot enter without a warrant. So ICE, immigration, cannot come into our clinic, we found out, unless they have a warrant for a particular individual. But not, they cannot do a raid. But they were doing raids in the lobbies of community health centers. So we trained our employees on how to form a human chain to keep ICE out of our clinic lobbies. And we trained and educated our patients on what their rights were as immigrants. And we formed right to health committees with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of our patients where we did education about, about their rights as immigrants and as Americans. Uh, and that level of community organizing and, um, and resistance um, kind of took hold. Um, and it was on the front page of the LA Times and, um, and, the, and the, the immigration service announced that they were not going to continue to do raids in Los Angeles because there was too much resistance. So, and I'm honored that we were part of, of that resistance, that we were a small part of that resistance. So Nadine, before you speak, I just want to invite others to come up to the mic because after you have your turn, everyone here will have the, not everyone, some of you here will have an opportunity to pose questions. So please make your way to the mics if you do have a question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, am I on? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, really just to build on what I've heard, um, when initially, Kate, when you asked the question, you asked what strategies um, do I take, personally, I listen and I practice humility. And that's something, it's hard to do, but it is something that is much needed. When we are going to respond in ways that have an impact, um, so listen and practice humility. 
In terms of the uh, activism at Women's Health Clinic in Winnipeg, this is, and, and I would say the other CHCs in, in Manitoba, we absolutely do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I have a working group in my organization I call the Social Justice Working Group, and I have a Choice Working Group. And what these are staff-led initiatives that take on issues. Most recently in Manitoba, the, le the universal coverage of Mifigai Miso, which is medical abortion. We were the second to last province in the country to create, pr provide universal coverage. And you mentioned abortion south of the border. Well, that anti-choice sentiment is creeping north of our, up into our country, and we see it. Uh, recently in Manitoba, international students and people without status, well, people without status have always not had access to coverage, but recently the government uh, no longer covers international students. So at our clinic, we have an emergency fund and we provide free and low cost birth control to all folks who cannot afford it. We fundraise $130,000 a year just simply for our free and low cost birth control program. We provide emergency funds to people who cannot access abortion. And again, disproportionately, this affects racialized communities and it affects trans folks. Uh, trans men need abortions too, and guess what? We, they come to us and they, we provide it to them because the other two sites are hospital sites. We're the only freestanding clinic in Winnipeg. When we talk about issues, and I know we chatted yesterday, but when we talk about issues like poverty and you talk about children's poverty, almost everyone can get behind that, right? We say, we don't want poor children in Canada. That doesn't, that doesn't look good. Trudeau won't like that, even though, <laughs> even though it exists and we know that it does. But what we talk about when we apply a gendered lens and when we take the federal uh, action plans, like we have our national poverty, housing and homelessness and gender-based lenses and there are others but when those national action plans and strategies are applied to something like child poverty way, the way I approach it and the way I understand from my colleagues that we need to approach it is by a, applying a gendered lens we talk about every child has a parent and in many cases they're a woman they're a mother and so when you apply that gendered lens you're really talking about poverty for families. You're talking about poverty and you, you need to ensure the woman the, or the head of that household can feed the children in her home. <clears throat> I mentioned last week I was at a pan-Canadian conversation around housing and homelessness and we left that session together with the tagline, house a woman, house a family. And I think that can apply to health, that can apply to the issue of poverty and it can apply to sort of just about anything that we talk about. The last thing I just want to say was a teaching that um, was shared with me last week and I have permission to share it with you and I will, won't tell the long story because it could take half a day. But um, it was about a hummingbird and the reason the hummingbird really has a meaning for me, I have a tattoo of a hummingbird and every woman at this uh, meeting last week said they're going to get a tattoo of a hummingbird as a result of this story. Um, but it was really about a fire in the forest or in the woods um, and the four-legged creatures and the two-winged creatures were watching this fire and they were saying our home, our livelihood, our, ev you know, everything is being destroyed. And the hummingbird was flying over to the lake and picking up some water and dropping the water on the fire and kept going back and forth and dropping. And you think of a hummingbird, how small it is. So it's not a lot of water. But the four-legged creatures were saying, what are you doing? You're never going to put this fire out. And the hummingbird said, every little bit counts. Every little bit helps. And so that's actually something I also took away, that even though we may not feel like we're making a difference, I hear all of what you're doing and, and, and what we're all doing, every little bit counts. Even though if it doesn't feel like it does, it doesn't look like it does, it is having an impact. We did have a question at mic four. Yes, actually. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I, I actually think that this session is one of the sessions that should have been at the beginning of the, of the whole um, conference. Right now, probably about 
at least a third or maybe a half of the people who were here on the, on the first day have left. And I, I, I feel like the, the issues, the, the really important issues, which are, which are the, the context setting for um, the work that we as community health centers do, and, and the work of community health is just actually really being discussed um, in, in depth now. And so I, I, I don't actually really have a question. I, I, do, I do have a statement, which is that, um, that I think that we really need to rethink how, uh, what are the important issues and how we organize these kinds of discussions so that we start with these discussions, which are really about who is most impacted um, which are indigenous communities, racialized communities, uh, immigrant communities, LGBTQ communities, the, the communities that are, that are most impacted, and the work that community health centers as, as um, the locations that serve those um, communities that have the least impact. And then from there, go backwards to the, to the international declarations, which are important, but, uh, but a little bit less connected to the kind of work that we do. So, um, so I reflected um, this morning um, from um, the, um, um, in terms of Sheila, um, what Kultir's um, presentation, and I thought, unfortunate that we couldn't have get, gotten her for the start because she set such, I think, a beautiful frame for the project that is our collective work. Um, and in her presentation, I walked away as one of the strategies being much more acutely reminded about the urgency of the moment we're in. Like, there's a, like, the, the, like there is the, everything is at risk. Like there is nothing that we hold dear that isn't at risk. And um, as a stolen child from a, you know, from a land to um, a stolen land, um, as a, you know, a, a black body, is I see the need for an urgent engagement between um, indigenous and black peoples around an indigenous circle, and that doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we don't need to continue to have our community-specific organizing, but I think that there is an urgency because some of the same challenges. Um, that are operationalized differently and look differently, but the impact still is the death of people in our communities, the ill health of people in our communities. So I think about what's happening in Toronto in some of the neighborhoods where young black folks are meeting out violence against each other. And that I see as part of a colonial legacy. Um, is around the state will orchestrate a number of things and then leave us to finish the work. And we see what's happening in indigenous communities in terms of the rates of suicide. And I think that there is deaths happening in two communities that are equally impacted by racism, mm -hmm. by col histories of colonization, and what a powerful synergy it would be to bring young folks from those two communities together to talk about how all of these systems are producing self-harm. So, so, I, so I, I put that out to you as something that I think we need to, to think about. The other piece that I think about as an urgent call is, and we talked about this, Kate, when we met, is around the notion of allyship. And I always say, your struggle for equity need to be my struggle for equity because there is no inequality in achieving equity for some and leaving inequality in the path of others. So I don't need to always be in the room for these issues to surface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because oftentimes 
the weight of speaking against injustice is, is solely placed on the shoulders of those who have experienced the injustice. Mm -hmm. And I think we also, as an, as an organization, as, and as organizations in this room, is we hold places of privilege. So while we are working with marginalized populations, we all hold place, place, places of privilege. And it's about how do we use those places of privilege to be real allies in carrying forward the struggles of others. And sometimes being the one to speak up when it is dangerous for others to do that on their own behalf. Not to take away voice, but to strategically know that when a young queer person speak up, they may end up not getting employment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is their cisgendered um, sisters, brothers, and partners who need to carry that voice. So I also kind of throw that back at us as strategies. And these are not strategies that you need to go out and get funding for. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because oftentimes, we think that to make change, we need public funding. And I think sometimes to make change, we just need to apply the action to the values that we commit ourselves to, and it doesn't require dollars. If I, if I may, Angela, I, I second the call, and I want to share an example. In Winnipeg, now I will say in smaller jurisdictions, it's much easier to do the work. I'm just going to say that I've noticed that coming from Toronto to Winnipeg, I find that I'm, it, it's more manageable. It feels like I can do this. And I'll give an example. Uh, yeah, a, a very small group of activists in Winnipeg, they're called Black Space Winnipeg, and they're a black youth-led organization that's primarily, their goal is to bring the issue of anti-black racism to the forefront. And they do it in multiple ways, social media, activism. And they host a black mental health group for members of the black community. And they were, I, Women's Health Clinic reached out and we are hosting some of their groups. Another community health center was as well. So this is a joint effort. But in conversation with the founder, we were chatting and we were talking about Manit Winnipeg has the largest urban indigenous population in Canada. And here we have, again, just as Angela said, two communities that are struggling. And for, through a, 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 a social and racial determinants of health lens and a colonization mm -hmm. lens, we name the fact that these two communities need to work together. So I am currently, by supporting Black Space, an organization that has no money, mm -hmm. uh, with space and with resources to make that happen in Winnipeg yeah. and to start the conversations primarily with youth to be able to give them a space, simply a space and snacks and, and you know all the permission in the world to start the conversation about how racism, colonization, poverty, and the list goes on impacts their lives as two groups who are living alongside each other in a city where yeah, young people are being harmed on a daily basis. So I task each one of you, Angela put the charge, the, you know, the challenge out, I'm sharing with you something mm -hmm. we're doing and I task mm -hmm. each of you to do the same because mm -hmm. it's possible you can do it. It is not, I think no. for me, if not now, when? Mm. If not now, when? Mm. Because we can't wait, we mm. can't wait. Should we go? Yeah. Let's go to microphone three. Hi. I don't know whether it's on or off. Is it on? It's you on? can hear me. Okay. Hear My you. question actually was is a bit of a tag on now. Uh, <laughs> it's really from the perspective of the collective yes. and speaking about the collective. And I sometimes worry about we're so caught up with identity politics, but many of these issues are so interrelated, and I really like the response that you made. Um, but I, again, how can we challenge each other to really try to get beyond that? And f the, from the panel, what suggestions do you have for us within the community health sector to really try to make that happen? I agree with what other comments have been said. I think CHCs and this community is a safe place for 
for, to begin, and I think we have a leadership role to really pull that together. But as an aging queer man, and here in Ottawa, there's a real concern about the growing pieces of, you know, the, the polarization that's happening. But our concerns are, you know, we're coming after certain religious groups, it seems. We're coming after color. And this splitting and dividing that goes on, how do we come together as a community? Because I don't want to live in a community that looks like that. And so how do we pull each other's resources that I'm not more important than you, but we really man um, share our resources? And I just, can we have more conversations as to what some of the practical things we might be able to do? I, you know, um, I think that's a really good question. And I think, I think why that question is so relevant is because, you know, as we started the conversation, it was very much about how right-wing populism is dividing people and pitting people against each other. And so I think the question is how do we create a collective consciousness? How do we bring people together? Which I think we've been mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. right? But you know, in, in LA, in South LA, so South LA, for example, is historically the center of African American culture and politics in LA. And um, you know, the urban renewal programs in Los Angeles have been referred to as Negro removal. Mm -hmm. So in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. the population, the black population in Los Angeles went from 21% of the city to now 11% in 10 years. Mm -hmm. But there is still a sizable African American community, particularly in South LA. That's 30% of a million and a half people, right? But there's all these tensions that now have been created primarily by politicians who are competing for, you know, seats um, that have pitted um, what we call in the United States that have created the black-brown dynamic, mm -hmm. where African Americans are saying, well, you know, I've been here forever, mm -hmm. and, you know, these newcomers are coming in and taking all the jobs mm -hmm. and taking all the resources. Mm -hmm. um, primarily African American leaders, not mm -hmm. the community, not folks on the ground, mind you. They live next door to each other, and they help each other. Um, and Latinos with, you know, it's a historic, the historic racism in the Latino community, right? So you have all these dynamics. And what we decided to do, um, and St. John's is a historic African-American organization. Our board of directors is still majority African-American. And um, we were started by an African-American church, hence St. John's. And um, we decided to organize these right to health committees to have a dialogue about this black-brown dynamic mm -hmm. and to actually engage in mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. around these issues. So we had undocumented Latino moms fighting for Medi-Cal expansion for low-income African Americans. And when we went up to Sacramento, we brought busloads of Latino families who would not have qualified for Medi-Cal which is our Medicaid, public health insurance for low-income families, would not have qualified testifying for their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And when the county tried to cut the immigrant health programs, in LA it's called My Health LA, it was the African-American families who came out to the Board of Supervisors um, to, to fight for their neighbors. And I feel like when you create those kinds of relationships on the ground, that, that literally impact my neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, my child goes to school with your child. Mm -hmm. um, I, we, you know, oh my God, I, I, every Sunday I go to your house for tacos. Yeah. Um, that those, if you, you, have to, you have to build on it and in a way exploit those relationships that are, that are really there. And it, it's not about those political dynamics up here of these black and Latino populations competing over who's going to get elected, but it's really about how people are living on the ground and building on that um, to create a collective uh, community, to create yeah. community. Yeah. Uh, and I grew up in um, what they call social housing, so Toronto community housing, and um, in a building in, you know, in, in North York, sort of Jane Finch. Um, so it was really Jane and Wilson. Um, Wilson and Wilson and Keel um, in, in, in the city in, in Toronto and in that building 
um, white working class, racialized communities, new immigrant communities. We look different, but we had a common enemy called poverty. And I think there is, we need to look at identifying, um, so when we think about collective struggle and our collective interests, is what is the collective, what is the inequality that we are impacted by? And let's have that be one of the organizing um, forces that can bring us together, one of the pieces that can bring us together. The piece that I'm also um, not wanting to lose, however, is the fact that while we do that kind of collective organizing because there is a common, um, there's, a, there's a common attack, um, is that we still need to create spaces for community-specific organizing, and that should not be seen as contrary to the collective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I was just in a room where at the end of it, um, the sister said, you know, you're in a room sometimes and you don't see yourself. And when you're in a place that see yourself, that where you turn around and you see yourself in the room, it is such a joyous thing. Um, it is such an uplifting thing. And it doesn't take away from the collective struggle. But somehow we sometimes often position finding those individual spaces where community specific groups come together or populations come together as undermining the collective. And I think that both belong together. Okay. So just as we kind of, so just, so just to add, I think, to, yeah. to, to that comment. Yeah. Yeah. I will just add a couple of things because I would agree with all of what's been said. I think that it's so important for us me individually to show up in places where I am the mm. other mm. Um, mm. frequently. So it's important to show up in a space where I am the only one like me and mm -hmm. I am learning from the people there um, so that I can also then hold space for that in, in, in mm. reciprocity. Um, I think that it dovetails well with humility and, and not trying to say I'm an expert for anyone else, but if I can hold space for people um, to be able to um, share their anger, for, frankly, or to grieve with me um, in an equitable way, that alone is healing. Um, I also think it's great if you, can, if you can start to connect people. You can tell people, hey, you, the, the haves are pitting all the have-nots against each other for the scraps, right? You can tell people that over and over and over again. If they experience it, you're not going to have to reteach that lesson. And so when you, start to, when you start to bump up against each other in, in the way that Jim, you shared, I mean, you are, you're bonded, you're in it. And so create spaces. I mean, our association tries to create those spaces for our members to do that. And we, we recognize so much more of our commonality. And we also hold space for those things that make us unique and different. Not that we have it figured out by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but I think that, you know, Make yourself the other for a while. Put, mm. put yourself in that position frequently, and then hold space for others. Can I, can I just say one quick thing? I just was thinking, you know, in, we have this struggle in the United States with community health centers where, oh, we're just healthcare providers, and we don't need to get involved in policy and politics, and we sh we don't, we're not community organizers. And I, I really strongly disagree. And I think to the question of building community, and, and collective action, we have to see ourselves. And I think Canadian health centers have a much better connection and sense of this than we do in the United States. I think we've become somewhat removed from it. But we have, to, we have captive audiences in our lobbies every day who want to become active, mm -hmm. who want to be active participants in their health and in, in social change. And we can't continue to, to think about ourselves as simply a medical provider. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what the Community Health Center movement was about when it started, and it shouldn't be what it's about today. And it's become that way, particularly in the United States. Thank you so much to all our panelists. A power panel, come and find them afterward and keep asking your questions. Thanks again. Thank you.
Thank you. I love what you said. I love it. It's a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mic three, I can't see you at all. There's a big bright light behind you. Please no do worries. pose your question. Panelists, could you come back up? I'm sorry. Thank you. We are over time and we are making time. Let's do it. Great. Um, thanks so much. I'm, I realized that you couldn't see me because of the lights. Um, so I just really wanted to talk about the issue um, of power um, and get some feedback on that. Um, so we talk a we, there was a question earlier about identity politics and it really just got me, got me thinking. Um, so it just didn't, I just wanted to raise this issue. Um, when we're talking about power, often like the conversation goes towards representation. Representation um, has been framed as the overarching solution to health equity within our organizations at the community health center level. Um, so I would like, really, really like to get the feedback from those on the panel about how representation works in organizations. So if we put folks in positions um, of directors, managers, executive directors, how are we actually safeguarding the fact that a lot of the times when the these folks raise what community is saying in those rooms, they're demonized for it. Or those, or those um, it's called race baiting or other, other ways of, of, um, of demonizing folks that are actually talking about what's happening in our communities. So in my background, I work at a community health center here in Ottawa where I coordinate the HIV testing program. So we can see that when we don't talk about um, identity, we end up with issues like we saw just this past December when the Ontario HIV Treatment Network hosted a conference called Endgame. Endgame to make it seem like we're getting to an end game in terms of HIV. We're getting to an end game in terms of HIV in certain communities. Priority populations in HIV which include a broad MSM category, a broad black category, a broad um, category of women at risk, indigenous folks and people who use drugs. So when I look at the community that I come from, black gay men, we're still seeing a crisis. We're seeing rates of HIV increasing. We're seeing rates of HIV in certain communities increasing or staying the same. So I'd really like to know from your perspectives, how are we safe Guarding voices within our organizations to be able to raise these issues. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll take a start, and you know I'm sure there are many, many, many other comments to come. Um, so I, um, I often throw a fly in the ointment when we think about representation. Because for me, representation without a politic and without an ideology that's about social justice is just representation. It's not change. Um, and therefore, I believe that we need to have um, different voices and different communities at the table. Um, I believe that racialized people, um, LGBTQ folks, folks with disability, so when you look at the spectrum of um, folks who are challenging and striving for equity and inclusion, that those, vo those bodies and voices need to be at the table. I also want, at the same time, for those voices and bodies to also come with a politic and an agenda that is about advancing and pushing. Um, because oftentimes, sometimes organizations only look for representation. And therefore, what we then end up with is a kind of a tokenistic engagement. Very much so. And not a social change. And then they, you know, sometimes you get invited to the table and then people are annoyed that you actually speak. <laughs> <laughs> and because really you were just here for the flavor. Yeah. Yeah? Um, and at the same time, I want to have um, folks at the table, but with a politic, because I also, I, I hearken back to, you know, we had Condoleezza Rice, you know, in a, you know, our lovely Condoleezza, love her, um, fiercely smart, but goodness, we don't share a politic. 
Um, and so I want to share a politic of progression and agenda uh, uh, in terms of social justice uh, moving. I also believe that sometimes um, organizations um, use um, representation as a way to bring in just a few. So you can only have so much. We have three black people on the board. What are you talking about? Black people aren't involved in the organization. Mm -hmm. So sometimes representation get used to set the ceiling. And that then says there is no, nothing more that needs to be done. Um, so I believe in proliferation and infiltration, um, which means that um, when we as marginalized folks and folks with equity agendas go into an organization, we lean in and open the door for others to come in. And that sometimes is using that place of power um, to, to speak up, speak out, speak back, and to continue to, when you are in those spaces, be attached to other folks who are not at the table. Because you will need sometimes those folks who are not at the table to reinforce what you have to say at the table when you meet the pushback. Um, so that's for me is a start to a response, yep. um, but by and large would love to connect with you after. Well, for sure, thank you. And if, yes, that's my mic on. If I might add, I feel like Angela, you just started off perfectly. One of the learnings that I have in this actively being in leadership positions where you lean in, you take a chance, you bring folks in. And I say take a chance, because not because the folks you're bringing in aren't capable and qualified and can do the job, but you know the environment you're bringing them into may not be culturally safe. You know that, I think as Tyler, you said, they're, you're questioned and challenged and saying the things that people don't want to hear. So you have to actually, as leaders, create the environment, a culturally safe, we've heard that term before, but I'm, I'm going to emphasize safety in that when folks do make decisions and do voice their, ish, their concerns, their valid and much needed concerns, that they are heard and supported and not pushed out because that is what happens. Folks get pushed out. So as leadership, it is incumbent upon us to support the people we bring through the doors. And it's not about identity politics, it is about social justice, it is about representation, because you have to represent the people who come through your doors. They will not trust that relationship with you if they don't see themselves reflected. That is diversity 101, it's social justice 102, and it keeps going from there. But what we learn as well, uh, and I can say firsthand in my organization, I came to an organization, I worked there in, over 20 years ago, I came 20 years later, and the landscape was exactly the same. And what I mean by that is, it was a predominantly white feminist organization, and it still is today. Not much had changed. I'm tasked with change to moving that needle. I am tasked with moving that needle. And as Angela said, that task for me comes with risk. And so I take the risk, and I think what I'd like to say is, don't say no, make it happen. Just make sure you create the right environment. Training, um, but not just training, because you can do all the diversity and equity and anti-oppression training you'd like, but continue the conversation, continue the challenges, incorporate it into your performance reviews, incorporate it into your, you know, ev your policies, your procedures, your board of directors, the governing bodies need to reflect that same, not represent and not just reflect, but live it, breathe it, and do it. So that's the last answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And thank you to all of you, those of you who held time and space and uh, to have this question and to hear these answers. So Nadine, Jim, Angela, Stephanie, thanks again.